this episode we're going to be departing Tangier, moving north to Gibraltar across the Gibraltar Straits and starting our sailing into the Mediterranean Sea. While we were staying a few months in Morocco, they had made tremendous progress in the marina uh, area. Uh, this is the new super yacht marina that's located in between the existing yacht marina and the fishing boat port. And they had just finished pouring these uh, concrete dock walls here. During our last visit to a cafe in the city, the street in front of our table was transformed into a demonstration. We weren't exactly sure what this demonstration was about, but there was a lot of medical students and medical professionals. Uh, so they were protesting um, some something to do with the medical uh, uh, facilities or support. We went to the souk one last time to take in the sights, sounds and smells while we prepared ourselves and the boat for the upcoming departure. And there are many things we need to prepare. For example, go have that last local beer. Stock up on the local fruit and veg. Go get that item in the souk you've been eyeing. Stock up on the local green tea. Try one last new thing. Repair your shoes. Repair some boat items. Fill up the propane tank. And say goodbye to your new friends. There's a pirate. A swabbing pirate. It's six o'clock in the morning and there's a pirate on the on the deck. I'm helping. And time to dedicate a day to getting all the barnacles off the bottom of the dinghy that have collected over our stay. There's nothing like a good rub down of your barnacles after coffee in the morning. The 12 volt power supply on the back of the boat makes filling the dinghy easy. Cleaning Peter's bottom. Cleaning my bottom? Yeah, do you want your bottom cleaned? I don't think I need to because there's some bits growing on it. And since we've been sitting here, this is the growth that has happened on the boat bottom. We decided to take the easy way out and have a diver come and clean the bottom of the boat for us. It's usually relatively easy to find someone nearby who works and lives on a boat. Uh, who will do it for less than a couple hundred euro. And usually they'll provide some video with an underwater camera of the pictures of your hull before and after the cleaning. We did hear that there was a travel lift nearby. Uh, we didn't see it, but uh, Apparently there is one in the Tanger Marina somewhere. Um, one of our last evenings I heard a noise from the hall and the stern and I went out to see what it was. It sounded like something was flapping up against the hull and sure enough it was a seagull. A uh, baby seagull was trapped underneath our boat and was starting to float underneath it and couldn't free itself and was about to drown. And so we took it out of the water with a boat hook and a bucket and we saw that it had a fishing lure stuck into its body in several places. Mm -hmm. 
So we wrapped it up in a towel and began the operation of removing the hooks from the seagull. And the poor thing had run into a, uh, a fishing lure that had multiple hooks on it. And there was one through its wing, another one through its beak, and another one through the webbing of its foot. The webbing of the foot was okay, that one seemed to come out with ease. The one in the beak was unfortunate, it made a bit of a crunch, and the wing was also okay. But in the end, the baby seagull was okay and happy and flew away, thankful that we were there to save it. A last night in Tangier. We're on the visitor's dock, spending the night. It's calm. It's calm and we're gonna head off in the morning we had our last drink in the sky five we just had a glass of wine over there with some buddies yeah that bar's kind of characterless not as good as the bars back there anyway home sweet home this visitor's dock is really good You smell like smoke? Yeah. Yeah, they still like smoke in, in the bars. Uh, we'd hoped to get away at seven o'clock in the morning shop to make maximum use of the currents that run along North Morocco. Uh, however, the customs uh, held us up for two hours. Um, they wanted us to pay uh, $150 fee for holding their dro our drone um, for the time that we were there and uh, complete a lot of bureaucratic red tape. So we were late leaving. We've had several questions on our YouTube channel about the Garcia boat and specifically about the systems on board. So we will try in each episode to include a system or two in more detail. So in this episode, we will cover the galley. So at one end of the galley, we have one of the DC panels, uh, basically DC panels for some exterior systems, bilge pumps and shore power uh, and hot water systems are shown here. Back here we have the remote solenoid switch for the propane. There it is. And the gas and carbon monoxide alarm. There's also two 40 volts uh, outlets here. And just a note on the outlets, we chose British outlets because of the robust nature of the three pin plug and the 13 amp fuse embedded into each plug. The oven range that we have fitted onto Chloe is a Force 10. The model is a gourmet galley. It's a two burner range and it can be run using either propane or butane. There are two watertight lockers in the transom that can each hold a single 13 kilogram propane tank. The size of the tank is good for longevity as it lasts us about one year, cooking at least once per day. The range is the only appliance on Chloe that uses propane and we chose this over the induction range for maximum versatility. We have a three kilowatt inverter about 11 kilowatt hours of energy storage and we didn't want to buy another 3 kilowatt inverter to allow multiple appliances to run simultaneously. Above the range is an operable window to let steam escape while you're cooking and it has really heavy duty hardware on it that we like. And then we have the sinks. It's a dual sink. Uh, there is a foot pump here that's attached to a three-way valve so that you can pump in fresh water or seawater if the, the automatic pump is not working. We have two water tanks. They're 260 liters each, so that's 520 liters. That's approximately 135 gallons. There's also the capability to transfer water between the port and starboard tanks. And this allows you to alter the ballast and the equivalent weight in each tank would be 260 kilograms. 
We also installed a three-stage filtration system to the drinking water, so we did not have to fumble around with adding filters outside at the source of the water on the dock. Also, the filters are as standard filters that you can buy at any hardware shop. There is lots of storage in the galley. Uh, we have slide-out um, plastic containers that were provided by Garcia, um, so they fit perfectly, and two two bins for trash and, and recycling. These are the most handy uh, storage areas in this particular galley. We use these constantly and so we store the most common items here. Next is a dual drawer refrigeration unit. It's a standard marine vitrifrigo unit and runs off of 12 volts. We opted for the model that does not use water cooling for simplicity's sake. And we like the deep drawers and the controls with which to set the temperature. And at the forward end of the galley is the area that we use for a coffee and tea station. This area is unique to the Exploration 45 version 2 model, which opened this area up for more counter space. In order to maximize electrical usage and minimize propane use, we use an electric kettle um, and we have vacuum sealed kettle and coffee maker. We especially like the efficiency of the Vector hot water kettle because it's insulated and you can dial in the temperature that you wish. We also have some more electrical outlets at the end of the galley, two 240 volts, one for the kettle and one, the other one we use for the pressure cooker. We also have an array of three 12 volt outlets and it's a handy spot to charge up our handheld VHF radio. And again, relying on efficient use of electrical and minimizing propane use for cooking, we rely heavily upon a pressure cooker which we keep permanently plugged in in this area. What we really like about the pressure cooker is that the energy draw is pulsed and not constant. There's also space here for a microwave which sits perfectly within this, this area of the galley and we find that this also takes load off of the propane and maximizes our electrical use. Finally, uh, at the very end we have a freezer in addition to the two refrigerator drawers. Um, it works really well, we've, used, we've tried it, but we find that we just don't need it for postal sailing so it's just an extra storage area. The really nice thing about the raised salon configuration is the visibility. You get nearly 360 degrees visibility with the windows all at eye height. And also with this configuration, your galley lockers are a bit different. They're all below the windows and so you don't get any eye height locker storage like you would in a traditional galley. However, cleanup is very, very easy over the range and the prep area as I just wiped down this surface here below the windows. The position of the galley was well thought out because it is below the level of the salon here. So when you're cooking, you do have something to lean up against if it is a bit of a rough sea while you're cooking. Line as closely as we can because we've got a, a easterly current that's pushing us into the Mediterranean. So we'll follow that and it's giving us about at least a two current, a two knot boost. And then at the last minute when we are due south of Gibraltar, we're going to cross the TSS um, as fast as we can, then take the wind across. So current across uh, Morocco shore and then wind across the Gibraltar. So uh, here we are on uh, BNG. We are here and we're going to come across to uh, just south of Suta here, following the coast to, to catch that free ride of the current. And then we're going to go north up into uh, Gibraltar here. There's the Gibraltar rock. And we're actually going to go in a marina in Spain, just uh, just north of Gibraltar. We've heard it's a better marina. Uh, Gibraltar apparently is a little bit unorganized.
closed right now with a lot of uh, construction and um, and they don't answer the radio apparently so we're just gonna hit this little marina just north in Spain in a place called La Línea so here's the TSS here and we're gonna jump over this as reasonably quickly and sharpish so we don't get splatted on the front of the super tanker and, uh, and then cut over into the Gibraltar Bay here Okay, we're uh, several miles away from Tangier now. And uh, there it is in the background. Horizon almost. 10, 12 knots of wind. We're pretty well downwind, unfortunately. And uh, the Moroccan coastline is looking very green. Quite pretty. So we're under full sail power now. We turned off the engine finally. The wind picked up above 10 and it's good enough for us to now sail downwind. We're jiving a bit as we go because it's right on in the middle of the Straits of Gibraltar right now and uh, our speed transducer has clogged up probably full of sea bugs sea creatures so I'll clean that once we get into Spain that's pretty easy to do we just pull it out and give it a give it a clean and stick it back in again water doesn't come into the boat. There's the Moroccan coast. That tank is just an anchor. Sitting there doing nothing. There's that one over there. We're starting to pick up speed. Much better trim now. While we were sitting in uh, Tangier, our speed transducer, our little paddle wheel that's at the bottom of the boat, all clogged up with sea creatures and beasties. So the uh, calculations that the BNG system uh, gave us would therefore be wrong. The boat's heading, uh, the direction that the boat is pointing, uh, is calculated from an internal uh, flutsgate sensor that's essentially an electronic uh, compass. Uh, that will behave correctly and the course over ground is calculated from a set of GPS coordinates. So that will um, be also calculated correctly. Uh, it's really only the boat speed, the actual speed the boat is passing through uh, static water uh, that will not be calculated because of the paddle wheel being clogged up. So our speed over ground uh, display would be correct because that's calculated from uh, GPS uh, fixes. But the apparent wind angle, the apparent wind speed uh, would ordinarily be calculated with a little bit of vector mathematics to calculate the speed of the wind that the boat sees. So it would have to subtract the uh, paddle wheel result from the GPS result and that would uh, give us a little offset that would uh, enable it to calculate the apparent uh, wind speed and direction but uh, because our paddle wheel was all clogged up uh, it's not going to be able to do that so we can only really rely upon the speed over ground we'll know better next time to pull the transducer out uh, if we're ever sitting in a marina or stationary for a while uh, just to give the transducer a little clean that should uh, prevent this from happening again in the future this is Dawn's favorite spot she likes standing there posing on the back of the boat Dawn you're a poser no. poser poser Tangemed 2 there, Tangemed 1 there. 
Okay, we're coming up to Port Tangermed now and we're starting our turn over the TSS early because there's no ships around and uh, so we'll start to bear north and if we turn now we can shave a couple of miles off the course. There's Spain. What a perfect day. About 15, 16, 17 knots of wind. Dawn's driving, making life easy. You're easy. Dawn's easy. Expecting the wind to really pop up quite a bit as we get towards the Spanish coast. The Tarifa coast is renowned as being windy all the time. And uh, so as we get closer to that, the wind is going to really pop up. There's some Arabic written up on the, on the uh, hillside there. I'm guessing it says, welcome to Morocco. I don't know what it says, maybe someone knows. It might say Port Tangerman. It might say, Welcome to Africa. I don't know. <laughs> it might say, Have a lovely day. <laughs> dawn. Sea sickness pills are affecting Dawn. It's like drugs. Drugs, man. So we're doing about nine knots, course over ground, and we just entered the TSS. So we're starting the cross now, and we're gonna snap it up a little so we're a bit more perpendicular. So about 12 miles to Gibraltar, not far at all. So we should speed up as we uh, get over there. But we're doing good speed right now. There's Suta, Morocco, covered in clouds. Right in the middle of the Gibraltar Straits. Couldn't get more in the middle. And we're just waiting for this uh, passenger ferry to get out the way. and then we'll cross behind There's the Gibraltar rock behind that boat. Okay, we put two reefs in now because we're taking the wind right on our beam. And uh, it's popped up to 23 knots, 24 knots. We're right in the middle of the, uh, the channel now, so I'm to avoid these big ships. We're doing about nine knots. Popping over the channel. I don't think we've hit ten yet. We might have done. We're out of the safe zone in the middle here, and we're right in the middle of the channel. And we've got to get across the channel before these two uh, big boats hit us. It's kind of like playing Pac-Man. Dawn's getting covered in spray. Yeah. Now we can clearly see Gibraltar Rock, uh, which is covered in monkeys apparently. There's a monkey. <laughs> We're out of the TSS now. There's the rock coming. We 
Allen's dropped down to 24. Coming into Gibraltar Bay, Espana, and the wind's died down now to. It's now only 18 knots. We could like to leave south now, but we're nearly here. Coming into Gibraltar Bay, you could see the heavy industrialization. It was almost like sailing around in a parking lot of tankers and oil freighters. Many of these ships have fuel tanks on board, and that's referred to as oil bunkering. And it turns out that this area in the Gibraltar Straits down to Ceuta is the second uh, market in Europe for oil bunkering behind Amsterdam and Rotterdam. The bay is also popular for tourism, for whale watching and scuba diving trips, and is also of concern for environmentalists, which are watching out for and trying to regulate oil spills, accidents, and tank cleaning of these oil tankers. The Gibraltar Bay remains an area of dispute between the Spanish and the British and the British believe they have some sovereignty over uh, the Gibraltar Bay a few miles outside of Gibraltar and the Spanish believe they have sovereignty over the entire bay. This was an issue for Spanish fishermen in the past and in the more recent history issue with uh, deep sea salvage operations that found ships from the 1800s and determining who received all the loot. Okay, we made it into La Linea, um, near Gibraltar from uh, Tangier, Morocco, and it was 35 nautical miles. And then we docked up at La Linea and man, that was that was one big concrete key, and it was 25 knots of wind right on our stern, and we were bouncing against this concrete key, and uh, our uh, uh, wrap got a little bit messed up. We'll, we'll show you a picture. Yeah, it was big concrete, unprotected, just pylons, and our little fenders, even though we have some A2 uh, polyform fenders, they didn't protect us, and so we got ripped up on the side. So I just put some a, a wrap, a wrap patch on her, and she'll look as good as new. There's Gibraltar flag with Gibraltar rock in the background. Once docked up and settled into the marina, it was quite comfortable. It's large, spacious and uh, nice showers, uh, restaurants around, and there's a chandlery nearby. Oh, and you also get great views of Gibraltar Rock. The main attraction, the Gibraltar Rock, is 426 meters high, but the area is pretty densely populated. They have 32,000 people over only two and a half square miles. Though in the past, the economy was dominated primarily by the British military, especially when the border with Spain was closed. These days, it's dominated much more by financial services, online gambling, shipping, and tourism. And this is all aided by the fact that Gibraltar is a VAT-free zone. They have low corporate tax rates, and also they have many incentives to bring in international businesses. Stand over by the railing. We're inside the Gibraltar Rock, in the guts, in the entrails. If you saw one of our previous video episodes in Tangier, Morocco, you saw that we had visited some caves. And those caves were called the Caves of Hercules, and it was rumored that they were linked through a tunnel to other caves in Gibraltar. And it was also even rumored that the monkeys, the macaque monkeys, had made their way from North Africa into Gibraltar through these caves. Well, these are those caves in Gibraltar and they are called St. Michael's Caves. 
These caves are over 300 meters above sea level and it's one of more than 150 caves found on Gibraltar. The upper area of Gibraltar is covered by a nature reserve, which is home to around 300 Barbary macaques. This is a monkey species with no tails, and these are the only wild monkeys found in Europe. Uh, however, I would call these monkeys semi-wild. They originate from North Africa, that's where they were brought from, and about three quarters of the world population live in the Middle Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Go on. Okay. Go on. <laughs> that reminds me of your mum. <laughs> I'm telling. <laughs> The monkeys are frugivorous, um, however, if you feed them, you can be fined up to 4,000 uh, pounds. They like to manage the monkeys themselves and have a whole group that does so. And um, just remember, don't get too close to them, even though they're semi-wild. They are wild animals and could do harm. Also, if you're wearing backpacks, they will jump on your back and they will open your backpack in about three nanoseconds. That's exactly what happened to Peter. You started a monkey fight. This monkey species is listed as endangered and is declining. They are protected in Gibraltar and because of that the population is increasing there. And they love these monkeys so much they would even announce monkey births in the Gibraltar Chronicle and refer to them by names given to them after uh, famous people within the region such as governors and uh, high-ranking officers. As an animal lover, it was wonderful to be so close to these animals and to be able to experience the nature reserve with them. So you may wonder, how did Britain become the owner of this tiny bit of land within Spain? It all kicked off when the Spanish monarch at the time in 1700 died with no heirs. But he did have some relatives in Austria and France who made a grab for the land. And that kicked off the War of the Spanish Succession. Well, Britain was joined in with Austria and in the end they made a treaty called the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 and gave the land of what is now Gibraltar to Britain in exchange for Britain withdrawing from the war. But this wasn't the end for Spain, who later tried several times to use military force to regain control of Gibraltar, ending in the final attempt, which was called the Great Siege, running until 1783. And that is the topic of this museum in the caves. In the end, the Great Siege was not successful as the British had time to dig more tunnels to strategic points and reinforce the tunnels with cannons and other artillery. The subject of sovereignty did come up several times later afterwards in the form of two referendums, which both failed to pass. The downtown area is a pleasant mix of tourist shops and local shops. They also have a marina area and it's all situated on the west side of Gibraltar. But if you do rent a car, beware, they drive on the right side of the road, unlike in Britain. There's even a giant floating hotel in the marina offering five-star accommodation in the form of a permanently docked seven-deck cruise ship over 450 feet long. In the past, old unused cars were dumped into the sea down a chute off the cliff, 
Perhaps these were part of the artificial reef that was created from items such as tires and a cable laying vessel, among others. There's also a mix of English and Spanish people there, and it's not surprising since about half the people that work there reside in Spain and come across the border every day. They even have their own language called Lenito, which is a mix of Spanish and English. The north end of the Gibraltar airport marks the border with Spain, and the airport's only runway bisects Gibraltar's busiest main road. It was really strange to walk across the runway, which they do shut down for landings and takeoffs. We're standing, we're walking across the runway in Gibraltar, where the planes take off. Well, that's all for now. In our next episode, we're going to be continuing up the Spanish coast into the Mediterranean Sea. And we weren't able to get that far because of coronavirus. We were ducked up for three months, but we were able to complete a lot of projects. And we'll be showing you those later.